Hello, everyone, and welcome to Literary Tales. I'm your host, Paul Krauss, and in this episode, we explore some of the poetry of Samuel Taylor Coleridge and look at the theme of cosmic love within some of his poetry. Among the English Romantic poets, Samuel Taylor Coleridge is an interesting case. He lacks the ecstatic personality and uniqueness of William Blake. He also lacks the mythic life and hagiography of Lord Byron. He equally lacks the supposed martyr's death of the great lyricist, Percy Bysshe Shelley. Furthermore, he isn't William Wordsworth, who, in youth, is credited for much of the radical Elan of the later Romantics. Yet Coleridge's poetry moves with a deep metaphysical spirit, one that calls us to contemplation as much as to adventure. I consider the great gift of English culture to be its poetry. If we want to consider the playwrights poets as well, Marlowe and Shakespeare certainly soar high into the sky and arguably Shakespeare is the brightest star within that sky of English poetry. If we consider some prose writers to be poets as well, Samuel Johnson ought to be considered a poet simply by force of, of his rhetorical style and wit. But beginning with John Milton and certainly carrying forward through W.H. Auden, the warm soil of England produced a grand garden of souls whose poems sing forth through the starry nights and call us to adventure, love, and contemplation. Samuel Taylor Coleridge is one such poet who synthesized what many romantics are best known for in the singular, the adventurism of Byron, the eroticism of Shelley, the contemplative pastoralism of Wordsworth. What makes Coleridge's romantic contemporaries better known and remembered is their undisputed mastery of a single aspect of the romantic craft, notwithstanding their own lives and legacies, especially in the cases of Shelley and Byron. Whereas Coleridge touched on all of the above, but wouldn't generally be considered as a grand master of the adventurous pilgrim tradition of Byron, the eroticism of Shelley, or the psychological pastoralism of Wordsworth, even though all of Coleridge's poetry touches on these themes. Yet it is Coleridge's ability to combine all into his poetic form that is worth our admiration and love, for it reveals his genius and the beauty which governed his soul. Concerning the inquiry into the heart of human nature, there are two prevailing views that are common in philosophy, the rational animal and the erotic animal. The philosophers of antiquity conceived of humans as rational creatures, whose primary problem was their enslavement to passion. This produced, in its extreme form, the anti-passion philosophy of the Stoics with its hyper-rationalism and intellectualism. While Epicurus endorsed a hedonistic materialism, wherein humanity was a passionate animal, it wasn't until the rise of Christianity, where the twisted and contorted attempt to unify human nature as both rational and erotic loving commenced. To be made in the image of God, the Imago Dei, Christian theological philosophy and anthropology asserted was to be made in love for love, and in wisdom for wisdom. Eros and Logos were finally united. All thoughts, all passions, all delights, whatever stirs this mortal frame, all are but ministers of love and feed his sacred flame. Those words by Coleridge reflect the romanticist emphasis of the Christian notion of man as love and God as love. For we are but ministers of love, as Coleridge says. 
If pre-romantic theology emphasized the assembling role of reason, ordering love to its proper orientation, romantic theology, especially romantic theological poetry, emphasized the liberating role of love in life itself, a reenthronement of passion above reason as the most godly aspect of our human nature. This wasn't to demean human rationality, of course, but in Romanticism's violent reaction against rational sterility, the ecstasy of love was the primary vehicle the Romantics latched onto in their rebellion against the mechanistic and passionless vision of man offered up by the so-called Enlightenment philosophers. What makes the love poetry of Coleridge so special is its embrace of the totality of the human heart. Not just mere eroticism, not just the mere gaze and smiles that flow from love, not just the mere forgiveness needed for reconciliation and relational persistence. Coleridge's in poetry embraces it all. She was there, Coleridge says, my hope, my joy. The love that springs from hope and joy, of course, includes erotic provocation. She leant against the armed man and the singing playful reality that love entails. I played a soft and doleful air. I sang an old and moving story, which leads the lovers to gaze upon her face. Furthermore, Coleridge understands that love is a pilgrimage, a journey. This journey is not always pleasing. In fact, it is often difficult. Through weeds and thorns and matted underwood, I forced my way, now climb and now descend, o'er rocks or bearer mossy with wild foot. Yet the pilgrimage, the journey that love entails, brings with it a joy in of itself. The journey, the pilgrimage, once understood to be a journey of love and beauty, allows the pilgrim to gaze upon all that is good, true, and beautiful. Onward still I toil, I know not, ask not whither, a new joy, lovely as light, sudden as summer gust. The journey that love is includes the self, for we are all on these journeys as selves, invariably including rationality, with the beloved, to which two journey together as one, as Coleridge says, and I may be her guide through the long wood, for here, my love, thou art, and here I am. The journey of love leads to a unity of souls brought together by that uniting spirit. What makes Coleridge's romantic poetry so profound is the fact that it is not mere bodies that enthrall lover and beloved. True, bodies and physicality of touch and embrace are part of Coleridge's romance poems, but his retention of the centrality of the face, the gaze of the eyes, the smile, ensure the serene and beautiful side to eroticism more so than the mere titillating and sublime that is characteristic of, say, the darker bodily romanticism of Shelley. Coleridge's romantic poetry doesn't forsake, as Shelley's romantic poetry does, that aspect of the Imago Dei in the face and the eyes of human beings made in the image of divine love, which is most visibly seen and encountered through the face rather than the, bo the bottom or the bosom of humanity. And of course, we know that Coleridge himself was a deeply moved Anglican minister and theologian, as well as being a great poet. So it's not much of a surprise that he includes this theology of romance, of eros, within his poetry. Romantic poetry toward the human other is not the only essential aspect of Coleridge's poetry. Romance in nature, the beauty and love that could be induced through traveling in creation was another component 
of the romantic spirit, which Coleridge captures with rhetorical and imagistic brilliance. Earth and heaven are united with man as the intermediary, who is the experiential bridge between transcendent and phenomenological. Beneath the moon in gentle weather, they bind the earth and sky together. Romantic, pastoral, and naturalistic poetry, especially from Coleridge's pen and mine, retain that theme of love as journey and in the movement of binding heaven and earth together through the action of human life, we see the totality of the true romantic pastoral and naturalistic spirit. It is not accidental or incidental. It is essential. Humanity is the bridge between heaven and earth, the link between the two realms. I climb the Coombe's ascent. Coleridge writes, the climb brings us up to the heavens, not to escape the earth, but to see the earth from a far more beautiful perspective. Ah, what a luxury of landscape meets, Coleridge's pilgrim lover in the heart of nature declares as he gazes out atop the mountain. These journeys and encounters in nature are enchanting and bring a drop of tear to the adventurous loving pilgrimage who is out in the wilds of God's creation and sees the true beauty and totality of it all. Moreover, there is also the musical reality of love and the cosmos in Coleridge's romantic traveling poetry. This too is important to remember that it is within the Christian tradition, starting especially with St. Augustine, developed forward by some of the Renaissance theologians, Dante in particular, it is from them that the idea of a musical cosmos emerged. In fact, St. Augustine wrote in various homilies as well as letters and reflections on music and beauty that God sang the cosmos, that he sang the world into existence. We live in a rhythmic dance. Augustine goes as far as to say that even our own lives are but tunes in a grand harmonious waltz of music. This too is captured by Coleridge. As we are in nature, we hear him often talking about the soothing noises of the animals, the birds, of all creation. Far off, the unvarying cuckoo soothes my ear. We live not in a cosmos of empty rainbows, but a universe, a cosmos of enchantment, song, melody, harmony, rhythm, and love. We live in a cosmos that sings with us on our journeys of love. Music is the melody of love itself. And incidentally, for anyone who appreciates the role of theology in the mythic literature of J.R.R. Tolkien, Tolkien's creationist theology of Middle Earth also includes a nod to this mystic understanding of the cosmos. For Middle Earth was created by song, and it was only in the disruption of song that Middle Earth fell into darkness. It's very much the same theme that Coleridge is building on from a 1,500-year tradition in cosmic theology where we really do live in a musical world. And perhaps this is one of the reasons why when we listen to music or the music of poetry, we feel a certain transcendental experience. If ever there was a romantic poet who embraced the best of romanticism and married it with the best of Christian theology, it was Samuel Taylor Coleridge. We love him and are inspired by his songs of love, not because they simply tickle our emotion and passionate hearts. They inspire us to love him because of the deep truths contained therein. We find in Coleridge that metaphysical yearning for love in adventure, an adventure in love, graced by the rhapsodic melodies of the cosmos, singing to us that song of love 
which governs the human heart. In this enchanting cosmos that Coleridge drank from, we see smiles, faces, and eyes, all prefiguring that divine face which we yearn to gaze upon in supreme affection, that image of true beauty and true love that moved and governed the very soul of Samuel Taylor Coleridge.